we got? I got three after. We got, uh, okay, we got 25 people here. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Whoa. Hello, welcome. Welcome to this final session of Minivate Virginia 2021. And I'm very excited to introduce this next speaker. Uh, he, Robert Fawcett, he is an agile delivery lead at Capital One. Uh, scrum master and agile coach. He finds great pleasure in developing strategic uh, approaches to helping teams and organizations achieve high agility. And being an agilist to heart, he understands that agile is far more, his words are far more, is far more than a process. So here we are. So self-organized sprint planning. So Robert, take it away. Excellent, thank you. And just a quick question. Is there anything after this session or we're done, done for the day? Everyone's Where, free to go. For, from a people perspective, from everybody attending, mm -hmm. we're done, done. Awesome, that's good. So the idea of kind of coming towards the end of the day, recognizing that we, even in our last session or earlier today, Bob was talking about um, the idea that when you attend anything for more than three hours, like Zoom just sucks the life out of you. So, uh, so recognize that many of you are probably like hanging on as best as you can as we enter this last session of the day. Uh, so I'm going to make it uh, as brief as we would like it to be. Uh, I'm open to continuing to have dialogue. Uh, in fact, I created this session with the idea that it's conversational. Uh, it's less uh, sage on the stage and it's more like having some a conversation with my peers. Um, however, if you guys don't have a lot of questions and it moves quickly, like it can be more like a lightning talk than it will be uh, an extended presentation. And if we get done, then you guys get a head start on your, uh, on your weekend activities. So cool. Do you mind if we go ahead and get started? All right, cool. I'm gonna share my screen and, uh, and I'll begin the presentation in just a moment. All right, can you see my screen? All right, I'm seeing some head nods, awesome. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about self-organizing sprint planning. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna take just a moment to introduce myself, have that cheesy uh, intro slide. Uh, I work at Capital One. I've been at Capital One for uh, way longer than I care to admit. Uh, you know you're old when you've been working somewhere longer than how old you were when you started working there. Uh, and that's true for me. So, uh, so I started when I was 19, and I, and I won't tell you how long I've been there, but I've been there significantly longer than 19 years. Um, I have a graduate of Liberty University. I've spoken at Innovate before, uh, which was really cool uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, in the center, you see my family. I have five children. I have twins that are 17, uh, and I have triplets that turn 15 on Monday. Uh, if you are considering uh, having multiple multiples, I, I would love to have a conversation with you. Uh, I would suggest like five teenagers at one time is probably more than most people would, would opt for, uh, but I don't think I would have it much any other way. Uh, and then up in the right-hand corner, you see uh, that is Charlene. We purchased a couple years ago a 2002 retired school bus out of Loudoun County, uh, and we turned it into a tiny home. So we take it camping quite often uh, we're planning a trip to Maine in July, uh, and next year we're hoping to make a trip all the way across the U.S. to California and back, uh, and check out all the stops along the way. Uh, and doing just a couple of my credentials down in the in the bottom right hand corner, uh, just because I see other people do that. So kind of put those on this slide. Uh, but that's that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an agilist. Uh, I'm not here as a consultant with another company. Uh, I'm here as a peer, uh, and I've been doing agile. Uh, for several years, and I've learned along the way that Agile is definitely something that you, like becoming Agile and doing Agile is, is, is a way that you operate. It's not a, it's not a practice that you apply. Uh, Scrum isn't Agile. Kanban isn't Agile. Like Agile is a, it's a, a framework and a, it's more than a framework. It's really like a way that you see getting work done. Uh, so I, I'm definitely less Agile purist and more in the, uh, in the idea of being able to leverage uh, agile to make the world a better place uh, for our teams, for ourselves, uh, and for the companies that we work for. That's just a little bit about me. I want to start with an icebreaker that has nothing to do with our entire 
uh, presentations today. So if you would like to go to pollev.com slash Minivate, and uh, we're gonna do just a quick icebreaker to keep it fun and light and uh, kind of see who's here and who's paying attention and, uh, and maybe who's not. So I'll give you just a moment to go there and I'm gonna bring over the other screen. Let's see if I can drag this over here. All right. And I'm gonna ask you using the participant uh, options in your Zoom channel, if you can just give me a thumbs up that you're able to see or on your video, thumbs up. All right, you ready to start? You guys talk back to me, I can't hear you. So you ready to start? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. So we're just gonna do a logo challenge and we're gonna get started. We're gonna start with our old friend Blackberry, which sadly isn't around anymore. And we're going to ask you to pick which logo for BlackBerry is correct. Is it the first one or the second one? All right, let's see. All right, very good. 60% answered correctly, 40% maybe don't never had a blackberry so that's okay <laughs> that was a bit hard i gotta say i had to think about that for a second all right on the leaderboard we've got several people up near the top good job go yvonne all right apple this one might be a little bit easier which one's right you can cheat and look at the back of your phone <laughs> All right, let's see how we did. 75% got it correct. All right, good job. And let's see how the leaderboard changed. Yvonne's still at the top, followed by, uh, I, I hate to put your, new, your name. Uh, would you please put out your name, Ms. Iyer? Shafalika. Shafalika, thank you. Shafalika, you're rocking second place, thank you. Uh, followed by guest 70 in third place. Let's keep this going. Skype, which now has been replaced largely by Zoom. So which Skype logo do you think is correct? All right, there we go. 83% got it correct. Very good. Yvonne still on top. Shafalika right behind. Doing good. Next one, Kit Kat. Which Kit Kat logo is correct? This one might be a little bit harder. All right. Most people, 69% got it correct. Uh, the second one, unfortunately, this, it does not have a hyphen between kit and cat. Let's see what that does to our board. Yvonne is still rocking it. Oh, we have another guest that's moved up towards the top, 915. All right, Instagram, which one looks correct? One more second, and here we go. Nice, 79% got it correct. Very good. Guess 915, taking the top. Adidas. I see some responses very quickly on this one. People know they're a brand from clothing. Sixty-nine percent. All right. Yes, nine fifteen. Still hanging on to the top. Yvonne, right behind. 
You got some Ray-Bans? Which one looks right? All right, looks like the voting has stopped. Here we go, 64% got it correct. All right, very good. Nice. All right, Windows, maybe you know your Windows logos. Which one looks correct to you? Thirty-six percent. Whoa, this one stumped a few people. Yeah, thirty-six percent with the uh, the correct Windows logo on the top. I think that may have changed our leaderboard a little bit. No, guest nineteen and Yvonne still hanging on to the top. LG, we're almost done. We've got our 14 responses and 71% uh, with the correct logo. Very good. Yvonne got bumped down the fourth. Oh no. Yes, 915 still hanging on top. Cafe Coffee Day. Never heard of it. Sorry. I must be out of it. <laughs> Take your best guess. See 14 responses, we're gonna move on. All right, the correct one is the bottom one, 29% got that one correct. So that changes things up a little bit. And I think uh, this is our bonus, this is our last one. This should be really easy, 99% of people get this one correct, uh, but this might help change the game for you. Which call button looks correct? Fourteen responses. Ninety-three percent. Ninety-three percent got it right. So we're not not too far from what we typically see. All right, Shafalika, thank you. Congratulations for winning that. Guess nine fifteen right behind that. JS. Do I get a prize? Your prize is you're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> like bragging so, uh, rights. <laughs> yeah. So the idea of this was really just to create uh, an opportunity to. Um, kind of get warmed up a little bit, get our minds back into the game a little bit. It's easy to kind of go into uh, a little bit of, um, I, I guess you could say autopilot as you're, as you're kidding, heading in towards the afternoon. So thank you for participating in that uh, exercise. So what are we after, right? We talk about self-organizing teams. This topic is around self-organized sprint planning, but what are we really after? Well, self-organized teams, of course, that's what we're after. Everybody talks about it, but it's really hard to understand um, and it's hard to really develop, right? Self-organized teams. If you've ever worked with agile teams, you know that's our goal is to have them become self-organized, uh, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. Looking at the scrum guide, uh, self-organization is a team and it's in, as an entity that can decide how they wanna handle their stuff every day, right? They don't have to be told what to do or how to work. Uh, they're able to figure it out among, among themselves. Uh, Scrum Guide says how we should organize ourselves so that we can deliver the sprint goal to an agreed upon quality specified by the definition of done. Sounds really uh, technical. Uh, if you boil that down, really self-organized teams can figure it out on their own. That, that's kind of the whole point is we want to get them. With self-organized teams, the teams decide who is going to do the work, how the team members are going to help each other, when they need to learn something new, maybe they don't have the skills needed to be able to do one of the items that they're being asked to do and how to prioritize the daily work. The team decides this. This isn't something that the, the leadership team or the agilist does for them, uh, the team does it. When we look at a group of individuals and, uh, and I'm probably gonna break a lot of the rules from the last session in this channel around the use of color. So just a heads up for that. Um, hopefully it's somewhat comical. But in this scenario, John's frustrated, right? It happens over and over again, always the same problem. 
he finally approaches the team and says, hey, I didn't get the data from the system. You got any ways to fix it? If you're working with a group of individuals, how they might respond to a situation like this, right? Here's the reaction. Fred says, well, that's bad. Gene, well, I didn't, I'm glad I didn't choose that story. Ron is like, I, it was fine yesterday. And then Jane is, uh, it helped when I restarted my PC, right? Are those bad reactions from a team? What do you think? Not yes, not, I don't like those answers. Yeah, it's not very supportive. It's all bad, right? John's on his own. He's trying to figure out this problem. It's his story. The others are like, we have enough on our plates. You need to figure it out. So from a team perspective, like that's what we see. Um, and unfortunately within the agile world, although it's not intended to be, we often find teams that are teams of individuals. Uh, and it's our job to be able to help them move beyond that and to actually work as a team instead of having four or five people that just happen to be on the same team. Uh, but they really kind of work on their own things in a silo and don't really look to help each other. That's John. You may have seen him before. He may be one of your engineers. It's a cheesy photo, uh, but I think it does the point of saying, like, this is not the kind of team that we want to have from an agile delivery perspective. What we really want is a self-organizing team. So the same scenario might look a little different like this, right? Gene says, well, let me take a look at Git. See if I can see if anybody made any changes. And Jane's trying to check her PC to see if maybe locally it works fine on hers or if something's going on. Ron says, hey, uh, it's starting to bother us too. Uh, I think we should do something to fix this. Fred, you're right. I hope you test it, right? The team leans in. They don't leave John out there by himself. They're out there trying to help him. And the summary is that they come up with a discussion. They're going to have to figure out how they can actually help move this thing forward. That's the way that a team self-organizes. And that's, that's the behavior that we desire, most of us desire, from the teams that we work with. And then John's a little bit happier in this cheesy photo. But the idea is the same. Like we really want to move towards self-organizing teams. That's what we're after. But it often starts at sprint planning, right? And that's the topic of this conversation is like, well, how do you do self-organized sprint planning? Well, here it is, right? How to do it. Figure out what stories you need, have the team figure out how to do it, take a confidence vote, done, right? If we, if we cut right to the chase, that's how you do it, right? Does that make total sense? Well, it's simple as that, right? It sounds simple, but it's not that simple, right? Well, why isn't it that simple? Team lead assigns work. This happens a lot where you have a team lead on a team, or maybe it's a lead engineer that happens to also be a people manager for other engineers on the team. And they feel an accountability and a responsibility to make sure that their associates are getting the right kinds of work for their personal development, for this, they're, they're trying to maintain uh, that the team has the work assigned to the people that know how to do it. It's an anti-pattern, right? But this happens, we see it all the time. This is why it's not simple to have self-organized sprint planning because your team lead likes to assign work to people. Why else is it not simple? Well, there's awkward silence. When you ask a team to, all right, go figure out how to do it, and they just don't say anything, and you have to deal with awkward silence. No one volunteers, right? And it's just like, somebody's going to take this work or figure out how to do it, uh, but no one volunteers. So it's not, it's not as simple as just go do it, because you're going to receive some kind of, of reaction and, and sometimes that reaction is no reaction and, uh, and they just don't do anything. Another one, not everybody can do the work and that's very true. We don't have teams typically where every engineer has the same exact skill set, and not everybody on the team can do everything. So that creates a problem, right? So it's not as simple as being able to say, let the team figure it out because they can't all do it. We don't have time for it. It's not efficient, right? I hear this a lot. When a team says they want to experiment with pairing or swarming or, or some other like method of being able to deliver work or having multiple people get involved, there's an initial reaction. Well, that's if we have that many 
involved in this or we do that thing that's going to slow down the rest of the work. We know that that's typically not the case, uh, but that is something that we, that's one of the pieces that we might have as a pushback. Another one is that's just not how it's done. And uh, depending on the organization you're in, that, that could be the way that that kind of response that you would get. Did I mention awkward silence? That's another one. And, uh, and they just won't go for it. The reality is a lot of these things aren't true. Like, yes, team lead design work, but there's ways to be able to get around that and to help them become comfortable with allowing a team to do their own sprint planning and figure out how to do it. There's ways to deal with awkward silence. There's ways to, to get people to volunteer and get work going. We'll talk a little bit about that as we go through our presentation. But really, preparation's key. Like, if you want to be able to have a team do um, self-organized sprint planning, you've got to be prepared for it. The first thing is you have to make sure that your team lead, your product owner, whoever is a lead on the team is on the same page before you bring it to the team. It's really, really important. What you don't want is to go to your next sprint planning session and say, hey guys, I heard about this thing called self-organized sprint planning, let's do it. And you haven't talked to your PO and you haven't talked to your team lead and they don't know what it is that you're about to try to ask the team to do because they're gonna wanna step in and solve it, especially when you ask the team to do it and there's a bunch of silence, they could get very uncomfortable with that as well. So you need to make sure that your leadership team is on the same page with you before you go and try it, right? The second piece is you may have to actually sell it to them. You may have to actually say why it's important that you want self-organized teams. That, that the idea of having a team figure out on their own who is best to do the work um, is not only gonna help make sure that the team accounts for all the work that needs to get done, but it's also gonna make sure that we actually set the team up in such a way that they can actually take ownership for what they're delivering. If you assign stories to individuals, um, what happens with that, we probably have all seen it. What, what happens when, when a, someone assigns stories, to, say a tech lead or a lead engineer assigns stories to people, what, what happens when you see that? Insert awkward silence. What do you think? Have you had this happen before? Anyone had a, a team lead assign stories for their teams? I think the biggest thing that that leads to is no buy-in from the team on their own stories. Um, and also it gives them a, like a sense of powerlessness and a lack of um, autonomy or authority to control what they're working on or to work on things that interest them. Absolutely, all of those things are true. It also fosters and breeds the idea uh, that we talked about before around it's a team of individual contributors. Um, and you'll see this when that happens, a lot of times engineers on the team, uh, folks that are delivering against the stories will care about their stories. They won't necessarily care about what their peers are working on. And even when you do a confidence vote, they're voting on their confidence to get their work done, not on the team to get the work done. So it becomes very self-focused, uh, individualized. Uh, and you lose this idea that as a team, we need to have each other's back. Uh, and if that means one of us is actually maybe falling behind on some work that we've uh, either volunteered to do or we're assigned to do, someone else needs to lean in and help that person so that as a team, collectively, we get all of it done at the end of the sprint. We lose that, right? When, when we have folks that are assigned stories and, and this is the work that you're going to do, you lose that sense of team accountability for the work that you have. So it's really important that we want our teams to have that, that team accountability for all of the work to be delivered. We don't want stories rolling over. We wanna make sure that uh, we're setting our teams up for success. Uh, and one way that we can do that is to ensure that the team knows how to do it. Another thing that you mentioned was the disempowering of the team. When we assign stories or we allow our team leads to assign stories to individuals on the team, we are essentially saying, we don't trust you to figure it out, right? We're not saying it verbatim, we're not saying it verbally, but that's what our actions are saying. Because if we really trust the team, we know that the people doing the work know way better about how to get the work done than the people who are bringing the work to the team. 
So when we don't allow them to have the opportunity to say, hey, I think we can figure this out, we're actually essentially saying we don't trust you and, uh, and we're, gonna, we're gonna assign you because we think this is the most efficient way to do it. Another thing that we need to make sure that we make sure our product donors and team leads are aware of is that we're probably gonna get it wrong the first time and that's okay. And that failure is an option, right? We hear all the time, failure is not an option. Failure is an option. Failure, that first attempt at learning, you're probably gonna get it wrong. I, in fact, I generally lead with that disclaimer anytime I'm about to do something new for any team is that we're probably gonna get it wrong the first time and that's okay, because we're gonna learn from that and we're gonna improve that and we're gonna get better the next time that we do it. So we need to make sure our product owner or our team leader are aware that, hey, it may not work right the first time, but we're gonna stick with this in, until we do, because we do believe that there's inherent value on in doing this. And if we stick with it, we'll be able to realize that value. The other piece is that we wanna make sure that each team member is briefed individually before attending or attempting to do this. So you don't wanna spring this on your team and then have, having never heard about this before. The idea is Slack message them, private message them, IM them, email them individually and say, hey, I'm gonna be trying something new the next time we get to sprint planning. Here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to set the team up, be in a position to, to identify how best to get the work done without leadership having to assign stories or tell people how to get it done. I'm just wanted to give you a heads up and let you know that, hey, I'm gonna ask for your help in this. Will you partner with me in this? You're not being deceitful. You're asking for them to partner with you. In fact, you're actually individually asking all of them to partner with you. But the idea is you're trying to get it to a place where they come to the sprint planning having an idea about what you're trying to accomplish, why you're trying to accomplish, and why you need their help to make sure that it gets done. So I highly encourage, make sure that you connect with each of the individuals before attempting to do this to make sure that they have an idea of what you're trying to do. You need to make sure your stories are well-defined uh, because when you get there and you, you're laying out the work that you're asking the team to do, it's gonna be a really good idea that if you want anybody to be able to pick up any story, they need to know what the work is to be able to do it. So make sure that your stories are, are well-defined before sprint planning, tasked out, if not tasked, bullet pointed with here's the work that needs to happen for this story to be completed. It's estimated so we know how big it is. Uh, all of that, anything that you have that maybe is your definition of ready, you need to have these stories meet that definition of ready before you get the sprint planning um, as part of it, it's essential prep to be able to have effective um, self-organized sprint planning. You need to understand what your capacity is, your velocity, you at least know what it is so that you can bring it to the team and make them aware of what it is before they start. You need to have a pretty good idea of how to deal with that awkward silence because you're probably going to experience it. And you need to know that you're creating a psychologically safe environment. It's a good idea that you would even have, um, in the event that you do have team leads or a lead engineer that's a people manager or people on the team, recognize that that's an agile anti-pattern, but it happens. You need to make sure that they can even put the disclaimer out there at the beginning that, hey, we're trying this. And like, I'm giving you permission to figure this out. Like, you don't want your engineers to feel like they have to make a decision that their boss is happy with. You want them to feel like they can make whatever decision that they feel is best for the team without the boss sort of feeling like they have to be involved or to course correct. Um, so the idea is like create a psychologically safe environment where team members can be open about how they wanna get the work done without feeling like you know there might be some repercussions if they do it wrong. That makes sense? All right, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. If you don't have any questions, feel free to type in none or NA into the chat box. That'll let me know that we're good and we can move on. Robert, I have a, I don't know if it's a question or an observation, maybe you can put, add some color to it, but you mentioned earlier, um, you asked us, if we'd ever seen a team leader, a team manager assign tasks, and I didn't say anything because I don't think I've actually seen that behavior much, but what I have seen is a team lead who is very interested in individual capacity. And what that does to sprint planning is to cause the same problems that you're talking about, right? If you're very focused mm -hmm. on what any individual person can do, then it doesn't open up the possibility for anyone to pick up any kind of task and start doing knowledge sharing and pairing and that sort of thing. So 
Absolutely. You said, when you said that um, sprint capacity or velocity should be known before starting, I'm wondering what you think is the right balance between um, doing that, at, I guess, doing that at the team level rather than doing that at the individual level. Yeah, I don't believe really suggest definitely do not suggest doing it at the individual level because that, that does get to a place where you're maybe trying to make sure that you're making sure that each person is fully utilized. Um, and if we remember earlier, I don't know if any of you attended Marie Dingus's presentation earlier today, she showed an example of what a fully utilized system looks like, right? And it's the picture of an interstate highway. Think about uh, one that might be near you, whether it's 95 or 288 or, or whatever it may be. When you fully load a system, what happens? Everything shuts down. Everything slows down. So we don't, we're not looking to fully utilize the team uh, for the velocity. We're looking at their average velocity of what they typically deliver as a team collectively. And again, if we're trying to promote the idea of that teamness, then we can't look at individuals. Uh, we have to look at them as a team. The other sort of piece of that too is the idea that Agile is not the most efficient play. Uh, in fact, when I look through like the Agile Manifesto and the, the principles of Agile, like efficiency isn't one of them. Effectiveness is, right? What we're after is we're trying to have the most effective process that we can in which teams can operate and deliver continuously, like indefinitely, theoretically, without getting burnt out. Uh, we're not necessarily looking for the most efficient solution. Um, and sometimes we have to make sure that uh, our leadership is aware of that as well. The other challenge that I often have when it comes to the idea of allowing the team to figure out how they want to get the work done is teams of contingent workforces, our, our workforce. Uh, this happens when we hire like teams that we typically put all contracted uh, associates on. And, and maybe you're a product owner or maybe you're an agile delivery lead on a team that's all contractors. Uh, and whoever the manager is, is of that team feels like they have to assign the work because otherwise the contractors won't do it. And that's, that's simply not true, right? Like the idea is you have to, you have to break the, the idea that, hey, these are contracted resources and instead these are people. These are engineers that have skills and abilities to get things done and, uh, and they're smart and, uh, and they can figure this out and, and kind of get away from the idea that, hey, because, simply because they're a contractor, I have to give them work. That's not true at all. All right, finally, right. sure, go ahead. Yeah, if, if we find teams in like uh, where the engineers are specialized in front and back end or, you know, those kinds of things, uh, what, what, was, what is your take on how do, how do you transform from that point to uh, teamness, like where they are able to pick their tickets and stuff like that? Yeah, the idea is that they should know. Like each team member should know what their skills are and what their abilities are to be able to contribute towards the work that the team is being asked to do. If they don't, there are lots of team building exercises, activities that can help it. Uh, you know, the superpowers one is a really good one where you go around and you get each of the engineers to, to talk about like the skills and, and abilities that they have. But the idea is that the team should know that. Like, like in, in theory, if you have someone, I'll take, we have an application at Capital and we call it Ease. It's the front end for our web experience when a customer logs on to CapitalOne.com. We have one engineer on one of my teams that really understand ease and none of the rest of them do. That's a gap, we need to close that gap. However, when they're doing this sprint planning, like that person knows that they're the expert, the rest of the, the people on the team knows that they are. So if they have a story that happens to involve some need for UI work, naturally they're gonna to look to that person and say, we think you're the best person to do this, do you agree, All right? I'm not saying that, I'm not calling out that person and saying, hey, this story looks like it should go to so-and-so because they're the one, like the team needs to come to that conclusion on their own. However, they may actually come to a conclusion where, you know what, I think there's a gap here. I think there's a problem. Not enough people on our team understand how to do this. I wanna pair with this person and the two of us are gonna work on it together. That way at the end of this sprint, that, not, that knowledge has been extended beyond that one person. And that's a far better outcome. I'd much rather the team align at that outcome than having the person that just happens to know how to do it be the one that keeps taking that work. And, and, okay. and would you say there is opportunity also, like coaching opportunities also? If Always. That happen? Yeah, 
Absolutely. Like our, our role as an agile delivery lead, scrum master, agile coach, whatever flavor you would like to call it, is to coach the team, right? Um, and that's part of the idea of like the self-organization. Like when we talk about the idea of self-organization is you're trying to get a team to be at a point where they really, frankly, don't need you. And will you ever get a point, a team to a point where they don't really need you? Not likely, right? Because we, studies have shown, probably experience has shown, uh, if you've been with the team long enough, you recognize that it, there's a powerful piece of being present that helps the team stay focused and to be able to, to maintain discipline and structure uh, and deliver based on what they're trying to do. Uh, teams that mature to a point where they don't feel like they need an agilist and then opt not to have one, uh, typically regress uh, and end up getting a scrum master again who helps them get back on course. But the idea is like, we're trying to get them to a point where they really don't need you. So that when you get to sprint planning, like they know what they need to do. They know what they're being asked to do. They know how to figure out how to get it done. They know how to be able to say, hey, this is too much work, right? I get that you've brought this to me and you're, this is your wish list and they're in prioritized order. And I know what our velocity was and I know what we estimated these stories to be before we did sprint planning, but we can't get all this done. I want the team to figure out of the eight or 10 stories that maybe they're being asked to do, which six they can actually get done and which ones they can't get done and why, right? I don't wanna, I don't wanna make that call for the team. I want them to be empowered to figure that out and come back to me as a product owner uh, or an ABL and say, hey, we've, we've done this exercise. We don't think these are gonna fit. Here's why, uh, do you support that? Make sense? Yep, yep, okay. Cool, all right. Last quote here by John Wooden, like failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Uh, I think most of us have heard this. If you, don't, if you don't prepare for this, it's not going to work, right? The idea is that you need to be able to spend a little bit of time doing some homework, reaching people, socializing the idea, and then bringing it to the team and recognizing it's probably not gonna go right the first time, but that's okay. And th this is the place that we wanna be. And not just with sprint planning, like we want self-organized teams, but it often starts here um, because if they, sprint planning is the start of your sprint, right? So you're, you're giving them the opportunity and the idea of like, here's how you work together to figure out how to get work done. We wanna do that here. So how do you deal with awkward silence, right? We know that that's gonna be something that happens. Um, so how do you, do you deal with it? Well, you give people the floor to speak. You know what that means? That means you have to shut up. And that's really hard sometimes to be okay with, it's, it's one thing to have 15 seconds of silence. It's another thing to have 90 seconds of silence and nobody talking. And you've had this itch and this burn, this desire to say something and break the tension. And you have to be prepared not to, right? Give them the floor to speak. When they start talking, don't stop them. Uh, allow them to have that conversation and a dialogue to figure out uh, what needs to happen to get the work done. Another thing is recap shared experiences. So if they, maybe there's silence and no one's, no one's volunteering to, to move the needle to start getting things going. After a while, you can break it and say, hey, remember that last time that we had this project and we did swarming and we had the whole team join and we did that? That was a really cool experience, right? Like, is that something that you guys might want to consider again? I'm not suggesting who does work. I'm not suggesting how they get the work done. I'm just simply recapping some shared experiences that they've had before that were, that were helpful, that they may desire that they want to do it again. Call out multitasking. If people are being quiet, they may not, they may just not be paying attention and they may be paying attention to something else. So it's okay to call out if you believe that people are multitasking and they're not paying attention. Give people time to order their thoughts. Sometimes you might get asked a question and you're not ready to reply right away, right? You need a few minutes to collect how you might wanna to respond to the question that you're given or the situation that you're asking to respond to. So be okay with that, give them time to collect their thoughts on how they might wanna to respond to you. Create a culture code. Some teams call this team norms. Uh, have something that allows your team to understand like this is what we do in these situations. One of your team norms when you're talking about how you work as a team, when you get the sprint planning, our team norm is that we self-organize. 
And if nobody's talking, this is what we're going to do, right? You can talk about these things ahead of time and already have your action steps planned out so that when you get to this situation, you know, you've already agreed as a team what to do, right? And at that point, you can just be reminding the team, hey, what did we agree to do when this happens? The chances are they'll step in and say, hey, we said that we would do this. Let's do this. And then you have a chance to kind of step back. The idea as you're coaching and leading a team to do self-organized planning, you want to be solving for as little as possible. If you feel like you need to step in just to kind of nudge things to keep progressing, that's okay. You're not trying to step in and solve any problems for them. You're trying to give them the space to do it. Sometimes it's good to re restate the why. Like, why do we do self-organized sprint planning? Like, remember, remind them um, about why we're meeting, what we're trying to accomplish. This is actually a great way to start your sprint planning session. I'm setting the context before we even start. This is what we're here to do today. Oftentimes we do this in retrospectives. Like we read through like, this is what a retrospective is. We're not gonna point fingers at people. No one's to blame. Like it's kind of the same thing. Like you set a disclaimer when you start the sprint planning. This is why we're here. This is what we're trying to do. This is where we wanna be when we're done. Uh, and you're sort of like reminding them about what it is that you're trying to do. Eventually you won't have to do that, um, but it is something that's useful in helping them to uh, maybe break that silence and move forward or even prevent the awkward silence in the first place. And then lastly is ask an indirect question. So one example could be you have a new engineer on your team and they just joined this week and now you're, they're at that first split planning and, uh, and the question could be, hey, how might we want to help this person get up to speed? Right? What are, how, how might we do that? And, and how we're planning out our work that this person gets up to speed in the best possible way. I'm not asking it to any individual. I'm not asking them to, to come back to me with a specific response. This is more like an indirect question to kind of get them to think about uh, how they might want to solve for a problem that maybe they hadn't considered. So how do you deal with it? I'm curious, like these are seven ways that we collectively can deal with it, but all of us have probably experienced the, the awkward silence at one point. So I'm curious from you, how do you deal with it? You can come off mute. Any great examples of how you've dealt with it before? Like One of the things that I did in a, a past team is we were trying to get through some of this, this early team forming. Um, both the, I was the product owner and, and my scrum master and I were both having to give the people room to speak and making sure that we didn't look at the team. They weren't looking at us because they kept looking for us to fill the answer. So we would just look at each other and take ourselves out of the conversation and hold each other accountable to not be in the conversation until they fill the gap. That's nice. As an ADL, do you think it's appropriate to leave the room, even if it's a virtual meeting, and let them figure it out? In the past, I have actually, with a lot of awkward silence, I have said, I've got 10 million other things to do. If this is not a good time to meet, let's end the meeting. Ending the meeting is definitely an option. If you're trying to get your sprint plan, that might be a bit dangerous, uh, but yeah, that is- But a, I mean, if it's not productive, it's not productive and the, the, and the team also feels that they need to get through their sprint planning. And quite honestly, I've never had to end the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that makes sense that we could definitely, you know, do that. There's, there's one thing I've done that's, I've done all of these, but the, uh, has anyone ever um, d get comfortable with being silent? If nobody wants to say anything, you know, count to a certain amount of time in your head, but I've been silent for five minutes, nobody said anything. And out of nowhere, we're not leaving the room, it's sprint planning or whatever. Mm -hmm. Somebody says something and it's profound sometimes, but I think for me, I've actually 
And I've said, it's okay, I'm very comfortable being silent. And I say it lovingly. I say, I don't say it's okay. I'm very loving, caring. I'll wait. I'll say, I'll say it open and then I'll be silent. And it'll be like three minutes and people start looking at each other and then somebody says something. They always will. In my ACC class, Michael Spade said, let the crickets die. <laughs> I love that. The reality is, is that people really hate awkward silence. So someone will talk, even if like, if you wait long enough, someone will talk. Um, and you may be burning up inside, like, please, someone talk. Um, but the biggest thing is that you're trying to resist solving their problem for you. You've taught them, right? This is what you coach them to do. You've told them how to do this. You've set them up for it. You've given them the parameters to do it, the leadership support to do it, you got to let them do it, right? If you step in and try to do it for them, you're not enabling them. You're, you're kind of just taking their work off of their plate for them. It's really important. Thank you for the great examples. So what are some tips for facilitating a self-organized sprint planning? One is quickly review your backlog at the beginning of the sprint planning. So before you even start asking the team, how they want to get the work done. It's a good idea to, to reassociate or realign to like, here's the work that we're actually being asked to try to do, right? In most cases, the team probably already has a backlog of stories um, and they probably already have some identified that they'd like to have considered in the next sprint. Review them, like do a quick walkthrough. Here are the stories that are intent candidates, right? These are the story candidates that we're being asked to do. Uh, or that we believe are the high, next highest priority things that should be in the next sprint. So quickly refresh their memory on what that work is. Provide them with their expected velocity before they start. Hey team, kind of took a look at our last five sprints worth of our velocity of stories actually done, you know, story points or stories actually finished and crossed the finish line. And this is what it is, right? Um, the, the work we're being asked to do for the next sprint may or may not fit within that but I want you to have the power to understand like what you think uh, what you're what you're typically able to get done another great thing to do is to make sure that you do have an idea of what your team's capacity is um, the velocity is great as an average but sometimes you may be running into the summer months and you have people taking vacation and it's a good idea to maybe re recalculate like let's take that into consideration we know what our average velocity is we have additional people taking vacation in the sprint there's planned time out of the office, uh, there's holidays, whatever that may be. Take those things into consideration before you, you know, take on too much work. Encourage them to self-organize, right? Make sure that they know that that's what you're asking them to do is to work among themselves to figure out how to get it done. Remind them of the various ways that they could do it, right? They could divide, they could pair, swarm, you know, there's, there's different ways of being able to, to get the work done. Um, maybe in a given sprint, it makes the most sense that they divide and conquer and that they, you, know, you take these, you take these, you take these. That's okay. That's an acceptable way if that's how they want to get it done. They can pair, they can swarm, they can, they can choose from a variety of different ways to get the work done. Um, it's a good idea just to remind them of the different kinds of ways that they could choose. Avoid suggesting performers. Do not suggest any person. This, this is the cousin of assigning stories. If you suggest that someone takes the story because they have uh, a certain skill set or because um, they've done work similar to that in the past, like that's not going to help the team. You, you want the team to know that and to figure that out and to be able to take that into consideration. So you want to make sure that you don't, you don't suggest, make sure your product owner, your Team lead doesn't suggest uh, performers for any of the stories allow them to do that on their own. Have one person claim accountability for each story. Why is that important? What do you think? Why is that important? And take yourself off mute. Do you have a response to that? 
If not, maybe you've experienced a situation where everyone owned it. And when everyone owns it, guess what? No one owns it. When everyone owns it, no one owns it. So no one takes accountability for making sure that it gets done because they just assume that everyone else is accountable for it. We're not necessarily saying that one person is responsible for delivering a story. We're saying each person, each story needs to have a person that's accountable for making sure that the work gets done. Irrespective of how the team figures out how they want to self-organize, how they want to get the work done, who's pairing on what, every story, every intent item needs to have a, a go-to person that you can go to check with and see how things are going if you need to, but also that is making sure that that work is actually getting done. Even if it's not them as the performer, they're taking accountability for making sure that it does get done. So it's important that you have a, at least one, uh, or usually just have one person claim accountability for each story. And then lastly is challenge them to draw the line. As a, in an awkward sort of place breaking the Agile rules, currently being a, a product owner and an Agile delivery lead for the same team, um, I don't think it's bad to bring them more work than they could actually do and challenge them to figure out where the line gets drawn. It's okay as a product owner to ask the team to do more work than what they have velocity to do. If they've estimated the work, they've story pointed it based on previous refinement meetings, and now it's sprint planning, and you know their velocity is 30 points, ask them to do 35. Let them, but give them permission to tell you what they can't do, right? Don't, don't feel like they, they have to like, well, the product owner wants all of these done, therefore we have to get them all done. Like I give them permission to figure out what, where they're going to draw the line, but make them draw it. Like don't tell them where it's going to happen because we want the team again to take accountability. We want them to figure out how much of the work that you're asking them to do, can they actually do? And which pieces of it do they not, they just really feel uncomfortable committing to getting done and being able to have that conversation about here's why we don't think that these can be in this sprint. Uh, and we're asking for your support in that. And if we happen to churn through this stuff faster, like we'll grab it. We'll grab it off the top of the backlog and we'll get started on it. But we don't feel comfortable committing to all of it. And here's why. I would much rather a team have that conversation than try to take all of it and then not deliver all of it, right? I'd rather them work with me in advance to say, here's the things that I think that we can do. Here's where that line is. Uh, and give them that challenge. Give them permission to do that. Lastly, remember that self-organization doesn't stop at sprint planning, right? So you've done this sprint planning, you've had them self-organized, you've had them figure out who's doing what, taking which stories, moving into the delivery phase, but it doesn't just stop there, right? That's just the start of it. The idea is you wanna encourage them to self-organize around everything, around solution designing, around problem solving. When an impediment comes up, ask them, how do you guys think we should handle this? around their core hour topics. If they have core hours, what should you talk about in core hours? When they do story refinement, what is the work that needs to happen? Let them do that, right? It's okay to facilitate a refinement conversation where you have stories and you're trying to talk it through and understand what needs to be done, but don't lead that and ask them, all right, what's the first step you need to do? What's the second step you need to do? Let them do that, right? Let them speak to here's the work that needs to be done and it caps for that. It's also cool to even let your team self-organize around retrospectives and other ceremonies. It's okay. I do this with stand-ups all the time. Every morning when we do a stand-up, especially that we're virtual, uh, the team knows I'm not sharing my screen. One of them is going to have to volunteer to do it. Uh, and usually it's like, who's up for sharing their screen today? And one of them will chime in and we'll, we'll end up doing it. Sometimes it's the same person multiple times. Um, when I see that happening, I encourage someone else to volunteer. But the idea is like self-organization doesn't just happen around sprint planning. It happens with everything. You want the team to truly be self-organized. Um, you can even do this around fun events. Let them figure out what they want to do as a fun event. I'm, I'm willing as an ADL to help like schedule it and take care of logistics if I need to. But um, you guys figure out what you want to do. Like it's not, it's not me as, as a product owner, a team lead, an ADL to tell them how they want to have fun, right? They need to be able to figure that out. Then they can figure that out. Uh, as a servant leader facilitator, we're part of the team. So we're engaging in this dialogue and in this conversation, but we're, we're not making the decision for them. We're allowing them to make that decision and figure out how they want to move forward. 
it's quiz time. And I just realized, oh my gosh, it's 4.58. So we have been talking way longer than I thought. How's everybody doing? Do you want to take a quiz? Do you want to call it a wrap? I'll do the quiz. All right. For those that want to, we will hang on and take a quick quiz. If you want to drop and you've got better things to do, by all means, go for it. You're not going to hurt my feelings. If you'd like to, again, go back to polleverywhere.com forward slash Minivate. We have another challenge for you. We've got about 11 questions, so it shouldn't take too long. Let me see if I can get it pulled up. This over here, play. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. All right, the most important thing for a team member is to, what do you think? Have their stories done, offer to help only if they feel they can, help the team member whatever needs to be done. Seven responses. I'll use that as my baseline for the next question. All right, 100% help the team with whatever needs to be done. That's absolutely right. You guys are on it. You're ready to know, you already know what you need to do. Everyone's on the leaderboard. Great job. Julie Bright, number one. The efficiency of each individual team member is key, is unimportant, or is important, but sometimes team members need to help out. What do you think? Eight responses this time, our new baseline. All right, 33% got that right. Efficiency isn't really the most important thing when it comes to self-organization. Like the only thing that really matters is that the overall value is delivered by the team. It is important, but sometimes team members, and, and that last one can be a bit tricky because it looks like you know, it's important, but sometimes they need to help. The idea is that it's not sometimes they need to help, it's all the time they need to help. If you're a team, you're a team, and you're there to help each other get it done. Can't be good, can't get done without being the whole team. Julie's still on top, congratulations. If the team encounters an obstacle outside of the team, what should they do? Should they call a meeting? Should they call the scrum master? Should they call the team lead? Eight responses, oh, nine responses. All right, 56% got it right. Yeah, they call the team together and say, hey, we've got this issue. How do we wanna deal with this? Um, they don't call the Scrum Master to fix it for them, although they probably do uh, more than half of the time. Hey, I have this impediment, can you help me? And that's okay. But the idea is you want the team to self-organize around how they can get that work done and not necessarily feel like they have to come tap you to get, get stuff done. Really still on top, Ryan second, Shafalika third. All right, when there's a story or task that seems to be too hard, what do you do? Team members should stay quiet. They should pass it on to the most experienced person. Someone should express fear and initiate a discussion. Nine responses. I think that's our new number of participants. 100%, very good. Someone should just say, hey, I don't know how to do this. This seems really hard. What do you guys think we should do? Is someone that can help me? Don't pass it on. <laughs> don't stay quiet. Good job, Julie. When a team member is complaining about some tiny issue, what do you do? Let the team vote on it. Let them be curious. Ask why they're, someone's being such frustrated by such a minor thing. Or it's clearly a tiny detail. Don't worry about it. All right, 75%, yeah, they should be curious and ask, hey, why are you getting frustrated over that? What is, the, what is something that we can do to help so that that isn't so frustrating for you? Uh, letting the team vote on it is not entirely wrong. You know, they should, they, as a team, they should figure out what they wanna do, but it would be great to lead with trying to seek to understand. Like, 
what's causing that person to be so frustrated? Julie is rocking it, very good. When a team member is insisting on doing something their way, the team should try to understand the other person's solution. They should ask the team lead what to do. They should just let them. Uh, it'll be on them if it doesn't work. All right, 100%. That's right, you should try to understand what's going on and discuss all the pros and cons before you continue. The whole group got that one right, very good. Self-organizing teams do not, what do self-organizing teams not do? Decide who's gonna do the work, know how to prioritize the daily work, learn how team members can help each other, look to the team lead to assign work. hundred percent. That's right. They do not look to the team lead to assign work. Very good. Julie's still on top. Self-organization often starts at sprint planning, true or false? We've got our answers. Oh, it's 50-50. Nice. I just do this in here because it was from the presentation. It, it often starts at print planning, but it really can start at any time. So either of those is probably true. Julie Sabir, JS, very good, staying on top. To help prepare for self-organizing sprint planning, you should what? Get the team leads, TOs on board, pull the engineering team together to discuss the concept, create a psychologically safe environment, know how to deal with awkward silence. Trick question. Definitely a trick question. Three of those were correct. Knowing how to deal with awkward silence, creating a psychologically and safe environment, and then also getting their, your leadership team on board. So any one of them would have been correct. Julie JS, Ryan, good job. What is one thing you should not do to break awkward silence? Give people floor to speak. Ask who would like to take a story, recap shared experiences, ask an indirect question. All of you, very good. You should ask, not ask who would like to take a story or a task. You gotta stop doing that. You gotta be quiet and let them do it. Julie, JS, Ryan, maintaining the top of the leaderboard. Self-organization stops after sprint planning, true or false? hundred percent false. <laughs> Very good, that was also a silly question. Julie Bright, number one, congratulations, Julie. JS in second, Ryan in third, Sudhir in fourth. All of you did a great job, thank you. And Julie, I do have a prize for you for this one. So I will connect with you, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will connect I'm with you afterwards. I'm not, I'm not more correct than anybody. I just read fast. Yeah, and you get more points by voting faster. So uh, yeah. it works similar to um, the, the other cool. tool that's out there. Kahoot, yeah, I love yeah. Kahoot. Kahoot's just expensive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this was fun. So thank you everyone for, uh, for spending the last hour of your day with me. And uh, I do want to, bid you farewell and I'll turn it back over to Gil uh, to close us out. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Robert. That was very, I love the information. I hope everyone had it. Uh, was very insightful for a lot of people. And that's the last, I did wanna share um, in the chat, there's a retro.innovatebreakvirginia.com. Anything you'd like to say and review anything about this session, any of the previous sessions, the entire event, please. Go there and share your thoughts again. Uh, Robert, thank you very much for taking time to share your wisdom and knowledge with us here. It was very, very enlightening. And thank you everyone here for, um, for being in this session and for spending time with us in the rest of this entire day. And I hope everyone have, it's the end of this, uh, the conference. So thank you very much and have a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care.